And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Two Guys in a Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And of course, with me is Daniel Rogers. Uh, we have both been extremely, extremely busy today. Uh, Daniel's trying to get moved into his new house, getting some bookshelves built. He sent me some pictures of them. They're really, really pretty. And we both talked about our need for more bookshelves because we just got books pouring out everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I might add more books on the way in my case. And, I'm sure, and, you, and I know that you have more books on the way as well. My so, Amazon wish list is uh, full. I don't know if uh, that's possible. Look, I, I just... Um, uh, I just can't stop. Uh, you know, my wife calls my car hobby an addiction, and I tell her, or she calls it a disease. And I said, well, you're exactly right. It is a, a disease. And I said, the only way that I know to cure my car hobby disease is to buy another car or a bunch more parts. And my books, my book purchases uh, for the research that I do, for the writing that I do, is likewise a disease. So I don't know of another, I don't know of a better cure for my disease of book buying than to buy some more books. <laughs> well, uh, my book buying is definitely a disease and I've <laughs> been very much enabled by, uh, <laughs> by Dallas. <laughs> That's for sure. That it is, is a, if, if I was a recovering alcoholic, it'd be like <laughs> buying me a full bar just for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's quite a way to put it. You're exactly right. You are exactly right. He has been extremely generous with you, and it's something to be wonderfully, wonderfully grateful for. Uh, oh, for sure. He is is a great guy. I, I enjoyed visiting with him today. Uh, we uh, we talked about a uh, an, uh, an upcoming debate presentation that I've been writing on. and Oh, and I was going to share with you before we went on air here, Daniel. I had told Dallas that I would appreciate any feedback, any suggestions for, for any kind of deletions, additions, subtractions, blah, blah, blah. Well, he called me up and he says, well, look, Don, you're, <clears throat> he said, you're the expert. I'm the novice in this field. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he said, here's the approach that I would take. <clears throat> and <laughs> he goes into this. <laughs> Verbal dissertation. Yes, I, he did it to me. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he talked and he talked and he talked. And it was fantastic stuff, mind you. It was really, really good. And finally, he said, now, Don, what you wrote is just absolutely fantastic. But what I've shared with you is the way that I would approach it. And I said, well, Dallas, listen to me. I said, number one. I agree with every single word you said. Number two, it's fantastic material. Yep. But number three, I happen to be on a word count limit. <laughs> and what you just said far exceeds my word count limit. <laughs> he, uh, he, he went into this deal with me the other day and we just were talking about this, uh, this one passage, you know, uh, and, pro and prophecy. And he starts listing off these lists of, of names and dates and places and events and how it all ties together. And I'm just sitting there going, I wish I could remember one of those names and dates. You know? I, I was uh, I was somewhat similar to that when he started talking about uh, yeah. the reign of Artaxerxes in yes. 453 and this and that and the other. And look, chron chronology like that has always been a bafflement to me. Always. Uh, I have struggled with it. But uh, he did the same thing with me that he did with you. He starts rattling off these names and the dates and you, you add this and you subtract this and you get here and it brings you here. And I, I'm like, hey, oh, okay, 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 got it. No, I don't have it, but that's great. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, uh, then he told me, uh, he's like, well, I went over this in my revelation commentary as well as in my book on Daniel. Well, have you? Do you have a copy of Dallas's Revelation commentary? Yes, I do, and I have his Daniel commentary. In fact, I've got two copies of it. And so you know that his his Revelation commentary 
is what maybe 400 500 pages long and it's all yes. an introduction yeah it's not yeah. even a commentary on revelation that's volume two that's in yes. the process of being written <laughs> i know i know yeah he uh, he is very very thorough and yes. i you know i told him uh he he was he was being very very complimentary uh, of me and my ministry and the work that i i have done and uh the um and of this article, uh, this uh, debate article that I had done, and he said, you've just been, you know, such a blessing to me. And I said, well, listen, uh, I want you to know how much that means to me, uh, because you have no idea how much I appreciate and respect your scholarship. So what and you've said coming from you, I said that that to me is just an absolutely incredible compliment. And I do appreciate it. And, and honestly, if, if anyone in our, you know, our, our kind of group of group of friends, you know, uh, that we, that we correspond with regularly, if any one of us is a scholar, it's Dallas. I mean, he's, oh yeah, the man, he wakes up every day and he studies. I'll talk to him at 6 PM. Sometimes he'll say, well, I'm thinking about getting back in there and doing some more studies. <laughs> well, it's when just I very a constant thing. Yeah. When I very first knew of Dallas, <clears throat> Uh, I, I met him first of all, face to face at Daleville, Alabama. I was there to, to preach uh, in, in a uh, seminar. He was as well. And I happened to go into a fast food restaurant and uh, I had never seen Dallas's picture. I didn't know what he looked like. And before I know it, here's this guy sitting at a table and he says, uh, Brother Don Preston. And I turn around and like, what? Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, been spotted, been made. <laughs> <laughs> and it was him, and he invited me to eat with him. And we had just a, a really, really great, uh, you know, time to sit down and visit. And he told me at the time that he got up somewhere around three thirty, four o'clock every morning and started studying, just doing nothing but reading. Yes. And I mean, I get up. As you know, I get up uh, sometimes, unfortunately, these days I get up at two o'clock and I can't, I mean, I wake up, I cannot go to sleep and I've gone to the office before at a quarter till three with my wife saying, you don't need to go to the office at this time of the morning. Well, why not? I'm awake. I'm not going mm -hmm. back to sleep. And so I'll even come in here to the living room, which is where I'm at right now and my computer and I'll work on the computer here at my office and or at my uh, at my desk here at the, at the house but uh, you know he's been doing this for umpteen years and it shows when you talk to him uh his expertise his his knowledge is so vast and his understanding and uh and yet <clears throat> at Per his own statements, the study of eschatology is relatively new to him. And so he he just devotes and dedicates so much time these days to the study of eschatology and assimilating it, harmonizing it with all of this other research that he has done and, and bringing them into harmony with each other. And that is just such a wealth such a treasure for those of us who have the blessing and the ability uh, to correspond with him. You know, yeah. I, uh, I'll get into a discussion with someone and they, they will try to make a point on the Greek. And I am absolutely not by any stretch of the imagination. I've never claimed to be, I'm not a Greek scholar. I can use the lexicons. I can appeal to uh, the critical commentaries and I can work my way through certainly context and I think so very very often I know that the argument that's being made by someone from the Greek I will know intuitively contextually uh, that it's wrong but if they're arguing from the Greek and well you know it's this tense and syntactically it's this and it's that okay that sounds impressive to someone uh, that doesn't know the Greek, even though they should be able to, to contextually demonstrate that it's an abuse of the Greek. Well, 
I just, I, I just call Dallas up or I send him an email and I said, Dallas, here's the arguments that's being made from the Greek by such and such. And, <laughs> and so very, very often he will say, that sounds like an argument that would be made from a first semester Greek student. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, he said that simply has no merit at all. And he just goes into explaining it. And then he'll write me an article uh, that I will, I will then post on the Internet or that I will uh, post in the, on Facebook pages uh, to refute what has been said. And that is such an incredible resource to be able to do that. It is, and uh, the the speed at which he can compile all that research and get it oh. to you is amazing. And what's incredible about it is he he has all of these top notch scholars that he pulls from to to justify the the statements that he makes. And he does that with he does that with everything that he does. You know, yes. I could write a I could write a paragraph on you know the song Jesus Loves Me. You know, make a few comments. And then if Dallas did that same paper with the same intentions, it'd be 18 pages long, have 32 <laughs> citations, um, all all PhDs from the top schools in the world. You know, <laughs> you're exactly right. You are. I mean, exactly the guy right. he, uh, he 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 just naturally um, produces excellent material. I mean, he can, yes. he can't help himself. I don't think. <laughs> well, and, and it just comes from years and years and years of dedication and commitment to being objective, to being honest. Uh, and and to knowing what, knowing how to research, and knowing uh, how to how to express this, knowing how to do the comparative studies of all the scholarship. Because let's face it, there are all sorts of scholars that are out there that disagree with each other. That's and, true. And he brings he brings those into it too. He bring he? he brings these conflicting. Uh, differing uh, comments from, from the different scholars, he brings them to bear and says, and here's the reason why uh, scholar such and such, and he's always ultra kind, uh, ultra tactful in doing that. But he said, here's why this comment from this scholar uh, is really not quite what the text says. And he demonstrates that. And I, I just really, really do appreciate like I said, being able, uh, being able to call him up, being able to send him an email and saying, is there any way that you can address this? And look, and, I, I know how busy he is. I mean, oh, yes, yes. He, he's advanced in age to be sure, but you would never know it by how sharp, how cogent, how lucid, how insightful his comments and his work is. I mean, if it, you're interested, it, by the way, and you're listening, all of his books and all of his articles are available uh, in a PDF form <clears throat> on freedominchrist.net, freedominchrist.net. Yes. And he's made all of his books available for free, books that would cost you $49 to purchase through Amazon. Yes, yes. Um, and, you know, here's one, one more thing I'll say about Dallas. I get ugly, mean comments from people quite often. Oh, yeah. But a thousand of those or even more mean nothing compared to him telling me that the article was insightful and deep and that he learned something from it. When he tells me that, you can say whatever ugly comment you want. Uh, it won't mean anything to me unless you've done the work that he's done. <laughs> I, I feel exactly the same way. And, and folks, before coming on air, uh, Daniel and I were talking about some Facebook pages uh, that are run by former preterists. And, you know, it's difficult to have to say it, and it's sad to have to say it, but I have not encountered one single truly honest, uh, objective, my, objectively minded, open-minded uh, former preterist on the website. They are ugly. They are vituperative. They're caustic. They're just, I mean, there are all sorts of adjectives that one could use in describing the people on this particular Facebook page. And, you know, I was telling Daniel, I, I have developed some calluses that are really, really, really thick. <laughs> I, I, I literally just laugh at how silly their ugly comments are anymore. Uh, I used to get angry. 
but the comments that they make, that they make, uh, even the personal insults that they throw, and they do this every single day. And then, of course, if, if you re- respond with even the slightest bit of humorous sarcasm, you're being ungodly. You're you're not being a Christian. Now they can call you every name under the sun, and I, I'm talking literally. Some of them have been uh, grossly, grossly guilty uh, of of cursing, and never called down for it. It's okay because they're fighting false doctrine. That seems to be their attitude. And so, like I said, over a period of time, uh, I have grown so calloused to reading, hearing that kind of of comment and name calling against me and against other preterists that, that I just read it and I just go right on. But when, when Dallas Burdett tells me that my ministry, that my books, my articles have been an incredible blessing to him, and that, like you said, he makes the comments of how insightful they are, how how exegetically sound they are. That uh, that means something to me. It really does. And it should, because you know he he knows he knows his stuff. Uh, when you talk about meeting him in a fast food um, restaurant down in Delville, that's what he does every day. You know, or it's like yeah. before the pandemic, it's what he used to do at least. He goes yeah. and he sits there in a, in a Waffle House or in a McDonald's with a stack of books and his Bible and, and file folders of papers that he's written or sermons that he's written. And people just come by and talk about it. Uh, talk yeah. to him. Yeah. And uh, we were, I went out to eat with him a few weeks ago and somebody came up and they said, are you still, are, are you still uh, uh, eating over, at, over there at the Jack's? We haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, well, you know, they don't open up early enough for me right now because of the <laughs> pandemic. And he's, you know, and the man just made a comment, something, you know, hope, hope your ministry's blessed or whatever it was. But uh, he'll go to the bank and they'll say, do you have any papers for us, Dallas? And he'll put it in that little tube and shoot it up the thing. Wow. That's uh, awesome. I mean, his, his ministry has probably affected far more people than he will ever know, uh, at least until at least until uh, God starts pointing people out to him in heaven. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. He's a remarkable man. There's no question about that. And uh, I just, I do appreciate him. He's been nothing but a massive blessing to me in my life and ministry ever since I, uh, ever since I got to know him. And uh, you know, we, we correspond probably not as often as you do because he's kind of taken you under his wing, uh, which is a, a, an untold blessing for you, but nonetheless, I do correspond with him on a very regular blessing uh, or regular basis. <clears throat> All right. Well, yeah, well, we, uh, as a, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> oh, my goodness. Uh, as we started to get off the air last week, I gave everyone a reading assignment that is directly related to the subject of the Messianic temple. And we, we've been pointing out how John chapter 4 is such an incredibly revolutionary uh, discussion of the temple, the Messianic temple. And when Jesus said to the Samaritan woman that, or the Samaritan woman said, well, our fathers worship on this mountain, and you, the Jews, say that Jerusalem is the place we ought to worship. And Jesus responds by saying, woman, believe me, pardon me, the the time is coming, and now it is, which neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall men worship the Father. And that was such a stunning, stunning statement to that for that woman to hear. And we pointed out how Zephaniah chapter 2, 11, Malachi chapter 1, 11 and 12, foretold the time in which that reality would come into being. And I, I made the comment over the last couple of weeks that unless we understand that prophetic background, John chapter 4 will not have near the significance and meaning for our understanding as it would and as it does if we understand that prophetic background. And yet so much of my early ministry life, Daniel, I had no clue 
that Zephaniah 2.11, that Malachi chapter 1.11, and that other places as well, foretold the time in which Jerusalem, literal, physical Jerusalem, would no longer be the geographical locus for the worship of God. And since I had no understanding of that prophetic background, John chapter 4 didn't just reach up and slap me across the face and go, look at what Jesus is doing. Now, <clears throat> we didn't discuss this before coming on the air, so I'm going to put young Mr. Daniel Rogers on the spot here. I'm going to play a little bit of the devil's advocate, Daniel. Okay. On the one hand, <clears throat> Again, Zephaniah 2, 11, Malachi 1, 11 and 12. On the one hand, we, we have Yahweh saying that the time was going to come in which Jerusalem will no longer be the, <coughs> uh, <coughs> the restrictive geographical location, the only place in all the world where worship could be offered. In every place, incense could be offered. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, men would be able to worship the Lord, Malachi chapter 1. Now, we have that, and yet at the same time, Daniel, we have Isaiah chapter 2 that said in the last days, which of course is the last or the period of time for the establishment of the Messianic temple. But in, in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, we are told, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills. Well, the, the mountain of the Lord's house, that's the Messianic temple. <clears throat> <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. It's been doing really bad today. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the prophet goes ahead to say in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3, Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. So in the last days, we have this prediction of going to the mountain of the Lord in Zion. And out of a host of other passages that could be cited, Zechariah chapter 14 tells us, that following the day of the Lord, Jerusalem would be the capital of the world. And that all nations would go up to Jerusalem every year to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So, Daniel, how do we harmonize <clears throat> that on the one hand, Zephaniah and Malachi tell us that in the Messianic Temple, there would, but there would not be any geographical uh, restrictions or limitations or emphasis. While on the other hand, we're told that in the last days, after the day of the Lord, all nations would flow to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle. Is that not a contradiction? How do we explain this this conundrum? Sure, and and I would start off by saying that there's multiple options depending on, you know, where you want to go. Number one, we could just give up and say that it is a contradiction <laughs> that either Isaiah or Malachi or Zephaniah or, or hey, even, uh, you know, uh, even uh, Ezekiel 37, they'll go yes. to the land. You know, either yes. they didn't know one of those, one of those groups of people didn't know what they were talking about, or we ought to use the scripture to interpret the scripture. And we could look to the New Testament, which says in, in you know in Hebrews chapter one, the writer starts off that uh, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, and in many portions and many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He's appointed the heir of all things, whom also uh, through whom also He formed the ages. And He says there that that Jesus is the He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. And I take that to believe that while we have different ways of prophesying in the Old Testament, Jesus reveals 
what the true nature of God is and what the true uh, nature of the kingdom is. And when we look to the book of Hebrews, it clears up all this business about uh, about my, about Mount Zion that you referenced a moment ago from Isaiah chapter 2. Because the Hebrews author does the same thing that the prophets do. In Hebrews 12, 22, on one hand, he says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. But on the other hand, in Hebrews chapter 13, he says, let's go to him outside the camp, bearing his approach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. The difference between Isaiah and Malachi is that Malachi is talking about earthly Jerusalem, that the Jerusalem below, to use the language of Paul in Galatians 4, was no longer going to be the central location of worship on earth. Whereas Isaiah, who talks about, as, he's, as you said there, this mountain, not only in Isaiah 2, but also in other passages, but just to name two, Isaiah uh, 25 and Isaiah 20, or rather 65 uh, and 66, is talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, or as Paul said in Galatians 4, the Jerusalem above, or as Revelation 22 says, the new Jerusalem. And so the distinction there, uh, the distinction there, Mr. Devil's Advocate, <laughs> is <laughs> on, on one hand, Malachi and these other later prophets were talking about Jerusalem as even though they've built this temple, it's not going to be the place where God resides forever. And um, Isaiah 66 actually gives us the, the context for understanding what the new Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem and all this is when he said that there is no house that you could build for me, right? So uh, to me, th that and, and trusting in the New Testament authors who were guided by the Spirit to interpret these passages would lead me to believe that there's two Jerusalems. There's a Jerusalem above, the heavenly Jerusalem. Then there's the Jerusalem below, which as he says in Hebrews 13, and it was not a lasting city. In other words, it would no longer be the, the central covenant city, but rather the city to come would be this central covenant city, and that's the new Jerusalem, which we are as the bride of Christ. Well, you did remarkably well, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this entire subject of, of two Jerusalems, is one that is unfortunately uh, tremendously overlooked. Our dispensational friends seem to have no concept uh, of this idea and the reality in prophecy of the two Jerusalems. And they go, they go to Isaiah 2. They go to Isaiah 60. They go to Zechariah 14. And they insist that when it says going up to Jerusalem to worship will, will be a requirement in, in the millennial kingdom, that absolutely has to be, according to their paradigm, literal Jerusalem. And so as a result of that, by the way, they also say that in the millennium, not only will people be required to go to literal physical Jerusalem, but they also have to keep the feast of old covenant Israel. Well, that's a little bit problematic. And it's, it's interesting to me to read some of the older commentaries uh, in which you see these scholars of tremendous intellect. Uh, one of them by the name of uh, Hingstenberg, who is a 19th century scholar. He came to, to Zechariah chapter 14 and he spoke about what a conundrum the text is, on the one hand, you've got Jerusalem that is being destroyed, the city taken, the houses rifled, the women ravaged in the day of the Lord. And then you have Jerusalem being exalted and the river of life flowing out from Jerusalem, from the temple, ostensibly the temple. And so Hingstenberg finally came down to, to the reality there must be two Jerusalem's at stake. And, and by the way, I developed this extensively in my book, Who is This Babylon? Uh, as I go through several Old Testament prophecies uh, that present this seeming conundrum of on the one hand, a Jerusalem that is destroyed. On the other hand, a Jerusalem that is glorified. Now the dispensationalists, 
they like to try to explain that by saying, well, yes, the image of Jerusalem being destroyed is very real. And the image of Jerusalem being glorified, that's the city of Jerusalem after it was destroyed being restored. They refuse to see the reality of a heavenly spiritual Jerusalem. And by the way, you, you made mention of the New Testament being the inspired interpretation of the Old Testament, men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The, the Jewish rabbis had a term for that principle, even though they were not recognizing, obviously, the New Testament. But even the Dead Sea community uh, understood the principle, and they called it the Raz Peshar. Now, I don't know if that's pronounced correctly or not. I'll be really honest with you. I have this uh, friend in Israel who is a world-renowned Hebrew scholar. I have asked him to pronounce that for me, and he says, you can't pronounce that. <laughs> You're a Gentile. <laughs> uh, he gives me a real hard time, and I give him a hard time. But he's a great guy. We en we really enjoy uh, corresponding back and forth. So anyway, the Raj Fashar um, hermeneutic, it was, it was an actual hermeneutic. The Dead Sea community believed in it and taught it. And Peter expressly mentioned it. In First Peter chapter one and verse ten, when after saying in verse nine that that those brethren were in the process of receiving the goal of their faith, that is the salvation of their soul, and then in verse ten he says concerning which salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, seeking to understand both the time and the manner of the things which they testified, to whom it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They'd administer those things which are now revealed by those who preach the gospel by the Holy Spirit sit down, sit down to us. So here is Peter explicitly stating the Raj Peshar hermeneutic. And, and again, by the way, the, the Dead Sea community out there at, at Qumran, they they wrote about the Raj Peshar hermeneutic. And guess what? They believed that they had the Holy Spirit to rightly interpret the Old Testament prophecies. And so they predicted, by the way, this is just a, a little bit of a uh, little bit of background information about what was going on in the first century Jewish world. The Dead Sea community not only believed in the Raj Peshar hermeneutic, they believed that they were living in the last days and that the last war, Gog and Magog, was going to take place in their generation and that God was going to use their community, the Dead Sea community, which may have, may have numbered somewhere at maybe 200 people. But nonetheless, God was going to use them to whip the Romans. <laughs> so here they were. They claimed to have the Holy Spirit to interpret, properly interpret the Old Testament prophecies. And God supposedly uh, was revealing to them that they were the true teachers and interpreters of prophecy and that they were living in the last days. The great battle would come in their generation, and they would whip the Romans. <clears throat> well, they sort of kind of missed it, except they were right. They were living in the last days. Only uh, they didn't whip the Romans. The Romans completely annihilated them, except for evidently some of them who escaped and buried what we know today as the Dead Sea Scrolls in the cave surrounding Qumran. So that that principle, however, <clears throat> uh, of the Raj Peshar hermeneutic is absolutely valid. And what is absolutely fascinating, and of course significant for us, those of us who are Christians, is the reality that the New Testament writers not only claimed that they had the Holy Spirit, they demonstrated that they had the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and 
They also said they were living in the last days. They said the coming of the Lord, the judgment was at hand, coming soon, quickly and shortly, and then it was going to fall on Jerusalem. And by the way, they were right. So there's your contrast. There's the, what, how would we express that? There's the proof of the pudding of who actually had the Holy Spirit, who actually understood the Old Testament prophecies, who properly interpreted uh, those Old Testament prophecies, and who was right in their eschatology. Proof's in the pudding. No question <laughs> about it. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and, you know, just talking about that proof in the pudding, how many people have you ran into, Don, and it might be similar to me, that were studying scripture on the edge of becoming atheist or agnostic, but preterism is sort of the, the thing that kept them from going there and actually uh, empowered and strengthened faith that they thought they were about to lose. Oh, you know, Daniel, I've been remiss in, um, in not keeping track of the number of people that have contacted me I had somebody contact me, uh, it was about two weeks ago, and, and they were just ecstatic. They told me the very thing that you just said. They were on the point of losing their faith entirely. They had almost completely given up. The Bible was a self-contradictory book of false prophecies of the end times, and it just... Something was wrong with traditional Christianity, and they discovered preterism. And now they are on fire once again for the Lord and for his word. <clears throat> and, and I've got to tell you, that is so thrilling to hear from people like that. Uh, and, and yet there are people... In fact, there's a set of videos on YouTube that I discovered not long ago. And it's a young man that has now, you know, you, you hate to judge a book by its cover. But this young man has the appearance of a hard rock uh, junkie of the lifestyle that goes along with the hard rock. So very often of of drugs and, uh, you know, moral excess and profligacy. I mean, he, he really looks terrible. I, I, I got to tell you, he looks terrible. Well, his story that he tells is that he was raised in a tremendously religious family. His mom and dad believed that the rapture was going to take place at any moment, literally, and that he actually was a person that was afraid for mom and dad to go to the store without him as a really young guy because he was afraid they would get raptured and he would be left behind. Wow. And he was literally terrified. And he said time after time after time, mom and dad would make plans based upon the latest prediction that the Lord's coming was just at any moment only to be disappointed time and time and time again. You know, and he's, uh, yeah, let me, let me just continue oh, yeah, a moment sure, here. Sure. He, he said, finally, it dawned on me that the Bible must be wrong, that Jesus must have been a liar. And, and this is so tragic. He, he didn't make the, come to the conclusion that it's all of these false teachers that are wrong. He, he never, he never considered that it was that theological environment in which he was being raised, that that's what is wrong, but that maybe there was another proper biblical answer. No, no, no. He just jumped to the conclusion, the Bible is full of lies. Jesus was a liar. His, the, the apostles were liars. And so now he is a raving atheist. And this unfortunately happens over and over and over again. Wow. So go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the, the that lifestyle kind of sounds like, uh, you know, Michael Miano's story. <laughs> he was telling me when I was at their conference that 
he he was training to be a wildlife survivalist. Yes. Because he thought that, you know, the electrical grid would shut down, there'd be mass chaos. And so he was basically trying to convince people to go out into the wilderness with him, you know? Yes, yes. And, and you know, that luckily that led that sort of uh, very zealous spirit that he had led him to discovering, you know, preterism and finding answers to the questions that he had. But, you know, for, for me, um, I had faith in God growing up, but it's, it's nothing. I mean, my, my, my level of, of faith and, and peace and joy is just, just so much greater than it ever was before I started studying eschatology seriously. I mean, well, that's, that's my story as well. I mean, I, I, I can well remember as a very young man, I was in high school and let's just say I was doing some things that weren't exactly right. And my conscience was just eating me alive. And I, <laughs> my bedroom uh, was on the west side of the house. I had red curtains and the highway in front of our house had a long sweeping curve and people coming from the west headed east their headlights very often shined into my room, but not normally in the middle of the night when I was already asleep. And I was laying there with my conscience just eating me alive. And here comes a car around that corner. His headlights hit my red curtains and lit my whole room up red. Oh, no. <laughs> and I just knew this was it. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. That was a Saturday night. The next morning, I walked right down the aisle. <laughs> and, you know, I've heard, I've, Laura, my wife, she's told me several times, you know, ever since we've studied this, this preterism thing, so much more of the Bible makes sense. The questions I had are now answered. And that's why we work so hard and you work so hard to, to find these Old Testament backgrounds to passages like John 4, because you might be able to have a have a good understanding of what John Four is talking about, and and, and kind of reach some similar conclusions to what we've talked about. But when you when you read what uh, you know what Jesus is drawing from, it just makes the entire Bible come alive. Uh, I want to I want to share with you this quote from a uh, from a, from a rabbi about Bible study, and it just got me uh, <laughs> it just got me laughing because of how beautiful it is. Uh, he's, they say this, the, the ancient rabbis likened scripture to a palace, alive and bustling, full of grand halls, banquet rooms, secret passages, and locked doors. The adventure, one rabbi wrote, uh, is learning the secrets of the palace, unlocking all the doors, and perhaps catching a glimpse of the king in all his splendor. <laughs> <laughs> And when I read that, I thought that was preterism for me because yeah. you, when you realize that this passage is quoting from this context and these Old Testament texts are interconnected, it just makes the Bible come alive. You know, uh, it's, it's well. Beautiful. Let me illustrate. Let me illustrate that very point with another Old Testament prophecy that just literally blew my mind as I began to correlate it with John four. All right. But not only John 4, but with the book of Revelation as well. Now, Isaiah chapter 60 was long, long, long recognized as a messianic prophecy. Uh, there's not just a whole lot of doubt about that. Uh, Isaiah, chapter city, uh, Isaiah, <laughs> Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 14 and, and following. Uh, and specifically in verse 17 and following, we have the description of the new Jerusalem that John quotes from verbatim, specifically verse 19 and following, I should point out. John quotes from Isaiah 60, 19 and following in Revelation to describe this new Jerusalem. And in this new Jerusalem, the sun shall no longer be your light, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you. The Lord will be an everlasting light to you. Well, there's Hello, that's Revelation chapter 21. So we know that Isaiah chapter 60 is a source and was a, a I, would, I would almost say a foundational prophecy 
of the Messianic temple. Now, somebody says, well, wait a minute. Revelation says there is no temple there because God and the Son, they are the temple. Well, that's, that's right, because temple is dwelling place. It's the dwelling place of God. But it's New Jerusalem, you see. And New Jerusalem is the, the locus of the, quote, temple, i.e., the dwelling place of God. So years ago, I was, I was looking at Isaiah chapter 60, and you look at verses 1 to 3, and it's a prediction of the conversion of the Gentiles. The Lord says, the darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his, and his glory will be seen above you. And by the way, we could point directly to Matthew chapter 4. Now, Matthew chapter 4 explicitly quotes from Isaiah chapter 8. But this is an echo of that. And, and in fact, it's a, it's a reiteration of Isaiah chapter 8. Those who said in darkness saw a great light. Well, that, that's exactly what's happening here. So anyway, the Gentiles shall come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar. Your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. Your heart shall dwell with joy or swell with joy, excuse me, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. And I want to stop right there and point something out. Isaiah 60 is contemplating the restoration of all 12 tribes. It's the restoration of Israel. Israel being the term for all 12 tribes. Now that's extremely important because in addition then, in addition to the restoration of Israel, you have the conversion of the Gentiles. Now that proves that the Gentiles are not Israel. Israel is not the Gentiles because after the, after the restoration of Israel, the Gentiles are called. And perfectly consonant with that, we go to verse 6 and following. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. Now watch this. They, they who? Oh, the Midianites, the Ephahites, the Shebaites, the Kedarites, the Nebaioth, Nebaioth, uh, well, whatever, those from Nebaioth. <laughs> uh, they shall ascend with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Now, wait just one moment, folks. First of all, who are these people? Well, let's see. The Midianites were the offspring of Keturah, Abraham and Keturah. They were linked with the Ishmaelites. Sometimes the term Ishmaelite and Midianites are used almost interchangeably. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 37, when Joseph's brothers beat him and throw him into a pit and they're contemplating killing him, Judah finally says, now, wait a minute, guys. You know, uh, it might not be such a great idea for us to kill our brother. So, hey, look, here comes a caravan of Midianites or they're initially called Ishmaelites, and then they're actually called Midianites. So there's an interplay in between them. Point of fact is, they're not of the 12 tribes. They are not of the 12 tribes. And that's critical. They're most assuredly not of the Levitical tribe. Hope everyone's catching the power of this. And by the way, the Midianites were the inveterate enemies of Israel. Go back to Judges chapter 6. And the Midianites were invading Israel 
And it was through the leadership of Gideon, somewhat reluctantly, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, through the leadership of Gideon, guess what? He defeated the Midianites. It, there's no way in the world to make the Midianites it, uh, Israelites. Were they of the descendants of Abraham? Well, that's not really a debatable issue, but that is not the issue. The issue is they are not of the Levitical tribes. They are not qualified to be priests. Yet, what does it say? What does Yahweh say they're going to do? They're going to ascend with approval with blessing, they're going to ascend the altar of the Lord and offer acceptable sacrifice. I got to tell you, Daniel, when I saw that for the very first time, I was literally, I mean, I, it was one of those moments where I, I literally stood up in my chair and go, wow, <laughs> that is absolutely incredible. You talk about revolutionary. This was revolutionary in the extreme. The very idea that non-Levitical men would ascend the altar of Yahweh and offer acceptable sacrifices to him on the altar at, well, let's see, literal Jerusalem, the literal altar, and you have non-Israelites, non-Levites doing this? Now, I understand that John chapter 4 does not specifically mention Midianites, Is Ishmaelites, you know, uh, it doesn't specifically mention that those of Kedar, Sheba, etc. But again, that's not the point. It has already told us has already told us worship will be offered anywhere and everywhere. Well, if worship can be offered anywhere and everywhere, then guess what that means? Anyone and anybody <laughs> can offer sacrifice to the Lord. And it gets us back to that principle, uh, you know, Daniel, of understanding that there are two Jerusalems. There's two altars, if you, if you want to express it like that. You have a situation in which, and, and I've, I've said this so many times down through the years. I've said it on this program down through the years. I have really honestly wondered from time to time. And what's interesting about this, I have not been able to find in Jewish commentaries how they explained these verses. So many of the commentaries that I have read basically ignore these verses. And, and I have to tell you, these verses are one, one of the set of the verses that I have intended, haven't done it yet, but have intended to ask my friend in Israel, okay, how did Rashi, uh, Rashi, R-A-S-H-I, -A who is still considered by by modern Jewish believers today, to be the greatest of all of the Jewish commentators. Now, I might be able to find his commentary on Isaiah. I haven't Googled it, and I haven't asked my friend uh, to find that for me. I, I like to ask him from time to time uh, to send me PDFs and to send me uh, documents and what have you uh, of commentary by Rashi. But here's, here's what Rashi does on Deuteronomy 32. In the predictions, for instance, Deuteronomy 32, 19 and following, in which the Lord says, because Israel turned her back, would turn her back on him in her last days, he would turn his back on them. Rashi tries, tries desperately to just gloss right over it. He never deals extensively at all with these prophecies 
of Israel's last days. And so it makes me wonder, and again, I haven't asked my friend, I'm going to, I want to know what Rashi had to say about Isaiah chapter 60 and the time coming in which these non-Levites were going to be able to offer acceptable sacrifice on the altar of the Lord. If that's not revolutionary, I don't know what is. What are your thoughts on that, Daniel? Can you hear me right now? Okay, good. Okay, um, okay. yeah. Sorry, I thought for some reason I thought I might have been muted. Um, I was trying to actually look here at a uh, Jewish website for his comments on Isaiah chapter 60, but I do not see them right away. Uh, you might be able to find it. I might be able to find it later, but I couldn't see it instantly, so I'll have to do it again later. Um, yeah. Anyways, I think your comments are very, are very insightful, and I had a similar reaction when I read Isaiah 19 and Assyria and Egypt yeah. coming together with, with Israel being To become there. one with Israel, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, all, and also the text talking about the restoration of Sodom in Ezekiel 16. Yes. You know, uh, very plainly, none of those groups being descendants of Abraham. Yes. And again, it just goes to show uh, what the nature of the temple is. Um, and I think you can really see this come alive in the uh, Acts 21 narrative where Paul is going into the temple and they say that uh, he must have brought some Gentiles in because they saw him with someone earlier that day. And, you know, they're really just trying to accuse Paul and have him put to death if they could. But uh, Paul would not take Gentiles into the physical temple. Now, if Paul's interpretation of these passages was that Gentiles would be allowed to go into the physical temple uh, during the reign of Christ, mm -hmm. then why didn't he take them in there? That's right. Make a big show of it. It's because he understood the temple differently, as he says over and over again in his uh, you know, epistles to the Corinthians and to Timothy and elsewhere. So that's, uh, that's my quick two cents on it. Yeah, well, I... I just, like I said, I have found this to be incredibly powerful. And, and I think, I think along with the passages that we have already adduced, you know, Zephaniah, Malachi, uh, and what have you, uh, along with Isaiah chapter 60, gives us incredible insight into the true nature, as you were pointing out a few moments ago, the true nature of the Messianic temple. And would to the Lord that our dispensational friends would be able to grasp this concept. Because... Uh, as you pointed out, Hebrews gives us direct insight into the true nature of the true temple. And not one place, not one place in all of the book of Hebrews is there ever a, a, uh, a positive comment upon, a, a number one, a continuation of the temple, the physical temple, or a hint of a clue, a suggestion of an idea of a restored physical temple. In fact, we find just the opposite in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 and 2. The writer says, after talking about the, the cultus, uh, the priesthood, the sacrifices, etc., uh, the writer says in that passage, now this is the sum of everything that we have said. We have such a high priest who has passed into the heavens, who has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, who has become a minister of the true sanctuary, of the true tabernacle, which God pitched and not man. Now, I, I think uh, G.K. Beale, Gregory Beale, made some very insightful comments on this. By the way, James D. Bales, uh, whom I know you don't know or didn't know, he passed away before your time, but both uh, James D. Bales, who was very brilliant in, in a lot of ways, but uh, G.K. Beale also commented on it and saying, when the writer of Hebrews says that Christ has become the minister of the true sanctuary, he wasn't saying that the old sanctuary was wrong, that it was false. And by the way, this gets into John chapter 4, being able to worship God in spirit and in truth. It's not like they didn't worship God according to truth under the old covenant, truth according to they knew it, uh, to, to the extent that they knew it, but rather the old covenant temple was a type and a shadow of the coming better things. And so in Hebrews 8, that's what the writer is saying. Christ is the minister 
of that to which the old covenant temple pointed. And we're out of time. Daniel, thanks again for joining me. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us here on Two Guys and a Bible on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. And with that, I'm going to say good night and God bless.